Hello and welcome to the end of the bad year. Bad for board games, bad for people who make them, play them, and have spent most of the year planning a YouTube channel about them. So this is our final list of the year. It was originally scheduled to be a 10 best board games of 2020 extravaganza, but because of, you know, I haven't actually had the chance to play 10 different games that came out this year. It's been such a sad time, so couldn't make a list of the best ones with any kind of integrity. Sorry about that. If you do want to know my favourite board game I've played, that came out this year, Unmatched Cobble and Fog. Victorian theme, variable player powers, light strategy, gorgeous art, tense gameplay, all my favourite things. However, what I can do to sign off this year with some sense of occasion is this. I'm going to run down my favouritest ever board games, share why I love them and what they reveal about me as a person. Hooray! This is a collection start and this time we're running down Adam's top 10 board games of all time. Merry Christmas. And also, if you want to give Phenomen Nerds a Christmas present, why not hit that like and subscribe button. It would mean ever so much to us and we'd love you forever by Merry Christmas. Number 10, Betrayal at House on the Hill. I love horror and I especially love horror tabletop gaming. Call of Cthulhu, Dead of Winter, Horrified, Escape the Aliens from Outer Space. I love horror games because of all the gaming themes. They're the most fun to host. I love hosting so much. I love picking the music, changing the lighting, dressing up, leaning into the tropes and honestly Betrayal at House of the Hill is the tropiest game ever made. It's all haunted house horror movies ever in a box. You're a bunch of explorers ranging from incredibly suspicious priests to potentially terrifying little girl exploring a house together as a team. Yay, tenuous friendship. Each game, the house is randomly generated and you explore it, gathering items, facing typical horror events like bleeding walls, spooky ghosts and the like, but then the haunt happens. It's a mid-game switch that you're never quite sure when it's going to happen, but when it does, one of 50 potential scenarios start. Maybe a swarm of bats attack the house or creepy vines burst through the floor a monster is raised from the dead and usually one of the players becomes a sudden dickhead traitor who fights against the rest of the group. Some of the haunts are better and more balanced than others but when this game cooks it's the best, silliest, tensest horror movie that you also get to play. Number 9. Deception Murder in Hong Kong Man lying is fun. Social deduction games aren't for everyone. I get that. Some people find lying very stressful and we shouldn't judge. They're the best of us. Some people don't like games like Werewolf or Secret Hitler because it devolves into the loudest players just shouting, well, that's what an evil player would say over and over again until fun dies. For that reason, Deception is one of the most accessible social deduction games for one very key mechanic. So brief overview first. So each player has got four blue murder weapons and four red clues. One of you is a secret murderer who use one of these weapons and clues to do the dastardly deed. Working with the good players is a forensic scientist who can't speak but tries to paint a picture of the crime using these crime scene cards and players use these clues to track down the guilty party and here's what makes the game really work. Every round each player gets 30 seconds to talk completely uninterrupted. It's hardwired into the rules that you can't interrupt and that's beautiful. There's been so many games of this where someone who's otherwise quite quiet and might not have spoken up makes a fucking brilliant point that turns the game on its head. Everyone's got data to back up their accusations, so it's not just, oh, I get a bad vibe from you, let's hang you. None of that. It's wonderful, addictive, not too long, and I can't recommend it enough. Number eight, Unmatched. So one thing you need to know about me is I'm a compulsive collector. Of course I am. This is my board game collection. I've got problems. When I find something I like, I want to buy every single component of it, completely understand it from every angle, become an expert in it. It's why I refuse to get into Magic the Gathering because I know what will happen. Bad things will happen. I love Unmatched and so I bought all of it. Look, the new Buffy expansion is so pretty. Look at Angel with his little sword and giant forehead. It's a simple move and attack fighting game with variable player powers which is a gaming turn for every player gets to do a cool unique thing with their own unique advantages and weaknesses. Love that. Because it encourages gamers to feel special in their own way, not just who's the best tactician or who's the loudest. Unmatch is all about that. Every character has its own deck with the best art in gaming, just BT dubs, and every new combination, maybe Dracula versus Sinbad, Raptors versus Invisible Man, Medusa versus Buffy, Bigfoot versus Sherlock Holmes, each pairing creates a puzzle to crack from both sides. So when you add to the game, with another expansion, you're adding exponentially to the game because you don't just add four new characters from Buffy, you're buying four characters who will have a completely different game against each and every character you've already got. I love it. Start with Cobble and Fog, it's the best individual box, but every expansion has something killer. Number seven, Innis. 
Ah, your dudes on a map game. All fighting and conflicts and territory squatting. Now, in terms of strategy, this is probably the heaviest game on the list, but it's not a heavy strategy game. I like them enough, but my brain's all thumbs, you see. I'm a dumb boy. Innis, though, is a special design, and I love it for a number of reasons. First of all, this theme. All Celtic legend, Gallic folklore. This art style is really something. Second, it's a really beautiful puzzle to be in the middle of. There are three ways to win, and each way requires you to do something wildly different. But everyone's also constantly shifting around, so it's like you're spinning three different plates, but also having to keep an eye on your opponent's three plates, having to choose each round which of these green action cards to keep. All of these cards are different and do different things, which means if you're doing this one thing this turn, no one else can do that thing. So you have to decide what's more important right now. Is it you doing a thing, or is it taking a card to prevent your opponent from doing that thing? And what if you've got three opponents? It's chewy, but just the right amount to savor, not so much you break your teeth on it. For a game that's so involved that winning feels like real actual triumph, it's surprisingly easy to teach and those games are gold dust. Number six, Chinatown. Not sure if it's clear by now, but I love talking. I love games built around talking, role playing, defending yourself, trash talk. It's why I game for structured, often thematic interactions with my friends, playing with fun power dynamics, getting to revel in behavior otherwise wouldn't, like lying or warfare or fighting for your life. But I also really love negotiation, and Chinatown is one of the greatest bargaining games ever made. It is ridiculously fun. You've got this map of Chinatown, you want to build businesses. You've got to complete the businesses to make the big money. Each turn, you're randomly given a bunch of empty lots and building tiles. Some of these lots and tiles will be valuable to you, but it's more likely they'll be way more valuable to another player who's trying to build near you. Then the market's open and you can trade anything and everyone's trading at the same time. It's like the stock market floor. Sure, Fred, I can see you're eyeing up this corner of the map trying to build an antique store. Well, I'd love to give you this empty lot, but man, it's going to cost you two of yours and maybe some cash on top. What's that? It's not fair. No, I agree, but I appear to be your only option right now. So shrug. Everyone's haggling over and around each other. Sometimes it's wheedling. Sometimes it's pleading. Sometimes it's threatening. It's sheer joy to see how people operate under ever increasing pressure. Number five, Crocodile. Yes, sir. It was number one on last week's list for a damn good reason. It's the best and also, sadly, the most expensive dexterity game going. Everyone gathered around a board to annihilate each other's dreams with a simple flick of a finger. As a four-player game, it is a hot mess. Still a lot of fun, don't get me wrong, but as a two-player game, it's near enough perfect. The game moves incredibly quickly, has enough luck to be unpredictable in the best kind of perpetually evolving way, but also skillful enough that you can definitely apply physical strategy to it. It's like pool. You start off hitting and hoping and re-evaluating with each turn, but when you get better at it, you start to add extra layers of thought. Not only which of my opponent's disc is the most valuable for me to hit right now, but also how am I going to hit it to place myself where my opponent can't get me. It's so rewarding, so addictive, and so expensive. I'm sorry. Number four, Blood on the Clock Tower. So I love Deception Murder in Hong Kong to bits, but this is the best social deduction game ever made. Why didn't it feature on the list of best social deduction games? I hear you punching through your monitor. Well, because it's not actually out yet. It was on Kickstarter a while back, but after a lot of delays, it still hasn't made it to the back as but the components for the game can be downloaded, printed out, and built at home. So I've basically made my own bootleg copy until my official one arrives. It's wonderful as well. Probably should have led with that. It's like Werewolf, but instead of just a few players getting fun powers, everyone gets a fun power. Unless you're the butler. F*** the butler. Most players are on the good blue team. Some players are on the bad red team, including the demon that kills people at night. So far, so Werewolf. Also, during the day, the goodies want to find and hang the demon. The baddies want to lie and bluff their way to survival. But here's where it gets really interesting. Because everyone's got a power, and all of these powers are built around knowledge and information, it means every player's power pings off each other in a way that's sometimes helpful in narrowing down who the evil players are, but often can be manipulated into hurting the good player's chances. Some powers allow you to find out which of your neighbors are bad. Some allow you to take out a demon with a lucky shot. Some allow you to prove someone else's innocence by sacrificing yourself. But also, all of these powers can be corrupted by evil players, meaning their powers can misfire, feed incorrect information to the team. It is a lot. 
to be sure. Also, in order to keep track of information being given out, which players are dead, basically running the game, you need a separate storyteller, basically a DM, who has the whole game arranged in this book called a grimoire, and who can, and often does, mess with the game to help the losing side. Don't know if I'd recommend it over deception for new players, but for gamers who want to do actual proper, crunchy, deep deduction, proper social detective work, I've been playing it every week in lockdown because you can combine Discord with an online lobby to perfectly replicate it, and it just never gets boring. Number three, Whitehall Mystery. So it's pretty obvious by now from like three other entries on this list that I like being sneaky. I love having private information that no one else has and coming up with the best way to use that information to achieve my goals. It makes me feel powerful and smart and it's addictive and yes, I want to play more forever. Whitehall Mystery is a hidden movement game where one player is a big old murderer secretly moving around the map so you never quite know where they are and the other players are coppers chasing them. The police are on the map so the murderers know where they are but the murderer actually has this screen in front of them and from behind it they write down which numbers of the map they're moving to. It's genius. There's a bunch of really good games with this mechanic, Spectre Ops, Fury of Dracula, Escape the Aliens from Outer Space, but this is the best. Not too long, not too complicated, just pure cat and mouse tension. The murderer has to move to predetermined spots on all four corners of the map in like an awful slasher world tour. The police have to stop and arrest them before they do. The question is though, which of these hundreds of white circles is the murderer on? The police move around the map on these black squares. When they stop, they can do two things check for clues or make an arrest at one of the circles that's next to them. If they search for clues and come up empty, they know the murderer has never been to that circle. But if it comes up positive, they place a footprint disc there, which means holy sh they were here at some point, maybe they still are. Suddenly what becomes an impossible hunt becomes a probable chase as the cops swarm in, find more footprints and work out the path the murderer has taken, closing in on them as suddenly things get un bearably tense and the murderer goes from can't catch me i'm the gingerbread man to oh god they're right next to me oh Oh god, I shouldn't have killed those people. Number two, Mansions of Madness. I like games that tell big, thematic, interactive stories where everyone gets something to do and everyone gets to be a spooky character. That's why I love Mansions of Madness, the game where everyone bumbles around a house, exploring rooms, fighting Lovecraft ghosts, and generally getting driven mad or stamped to death by one of Cthulhu's nephews. It's massive and unwieldy and not always fair, but it forever has a place in my heart, mostly because it's a game that I share with one other human being, specifically Tom, one of my best friends. Here he is on board game club. Tom's a DM and a great one by the way, really cares about atmosphere, inclusion and making memories, the cherished traits of a good DN DMC. Normally this game is played with an app that players all look at together and make their moves. When we play Mansions, instead Tom takes control of the app and sits out the game, running the music, reading the app, telling us what dice to roll, what we have to be, laying out the dreadful consequences with something approaching sadistically. It's a little quirk that makes Mansions a special experience between best buds. He loves to run it. I love to play it. We both love to talk about it. It's also one of the few games I play with my old school friends from Jersey, a small gang I've known forever and whom I don't get to see a quarter of as much as I'd like. There are countless great games out there, so picking your favourites comes down to identifying which games are treasured by you in ways that go beyond mechanics and design. It's about memories and people and connection, and board games provide so much of that because they're so social and people are so weird. I love playing weird games with my weird friends, which is why number Number one is Cosmic Encounter. The best game, the best of all the games. A really weird, lumpy, chaotic, hot mess of aliens clobbering each other in space. The game dates back all the way to the 70s and it's definitely gonna be one we're gonna deep dive in the future. But for now, just know that it's certainly not perfect in terms of design or any of that. But every single time me and my friends organize a board game night, I say, what would you like me to bring? And someone always says, cosmic encounter. It's a little like Risk in space. You fight each other with numbers. If you have the biggest number, you move into someone else's territory, but every single player is a different alien. And every alien has a superpower which breaks the rules of the game so wildly and so significantly that in isolation it would be wildly unfair. But when everyone is OP, that creates this insane cocktail of advantages, weaknesses, alliances, betrayals, powers and cards pinging off each other while everyone role plays their aliens. In the base set, there are 50 alien races to choose from. 50! Even if you never bought an expansion, and you should, there are loads and they're great. You'll never play the same game twice. Trixy, inventive, incredibly social, incredibly rewarding the more you come to understand the way rules can be bent in your favour. My favourite thing to do is play Cosmic Encounter with some close friends. There are a few better ways to spend your time. God 
board games are great. They are so, so great. Merry Christmas, everyone. Hope you managed to get something to the table over the holidays. And that's our list. What's your favorite board game? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to like and share this video around the internet if you can. And while you're here, make sure you subscribe to Phenomenus for more great board game videos to get you into the finest hobby in the world. Get on board.